morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Chris Alvin, and I'm the COO here at HR Locker. Um, today, we are delighted to have Chris Valentini with us from the Open Doors Initiative and Boy Employers for Change. Um, so, Chris, well, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, before we start, um, apologies to anybody who, with this bit of a background noise, I am on my holidays in France at the moment, so. <laughs> Just taking a quick hour out to to, to go through the, the webinar. Um, as usual, um, I would encourage anybody who has any questions and answers to uh, host any questions and answers in the questions and answers section. It should be down at the bottom of your page. Um, <clears throat> so um, please feel free to ask as many questions as you can. And um, if there's anything that I need to maybe go through or go through a later date, and we'll be delighted to go through that with you. So. First of all, lovely to have you here with us today. If you maybe want to just give us a brief introduction of both about yourself, the Open Doors Initiative, um, Boards for Change, all that kind of good stuff. Sure, yeah, thanks so much, Crystal. It's um, really lovely to be on this with you today, and thanks for taking the hour out of your holidays. I know that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Christabel Feeney. I'm the Director of Employers for Change at the Open Doors Initiative. For anybody who might be joining us today who has sight loss or um, a visual impairment, I'm a white female with blonde, straight shoulder length hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a black kind of jacket. You wouldn't think it's sunny outside with what I'm wearing today, but it's a black suit jacket with a black top and a skirt. And I'm seated here in my spare room, actually, like so many others, I'm sure, on this call. But I'm, as I said, the director of Employers for Change. Employers for Change, it's a disability information service. Um, we're housed within the Open Doors Initiative, which is our umbrella organisation. Uh, and in terms of uh, the Open Doors Initiative and the work that we do there, we actually support people from underrepresented backgrounds um, into employment and further education. So we work with our member companies who would provide opportunities and to whom we'd give support around their DEI strategies and the initiatives that they are running, as well as directly supporting participants as well from underrepresented groups to ensure that they're getting those opportunities and that they're being provided with kind of uh, education opportunities to upskill as well, you know, for like the interview process and um, your CV, all of that too. Great, thanks, Chris. Well, and we've we've chatted a couple of times uh, yeah. the last couple uh, of months now, just in regards to, I suppose, the importance of um, employers, I suppose, really embracing um, the DEI stage, not just from the um, in, internal, but also through the the um, recruitment side, so I suppose really the entire employee life cycle. But if you start really um, at the top, so what is BNI in today's world? And why is it important? In yeah, so look. The million dollar question. Yeah. And look, I do think that sometimes when we uh, with the abbreviations of so many uh, of so many words and different things that um, True meaning can get a little bit lost, and I know as well people feel probably sometimes that, but there's so much about DEI, I don't even know where to start. When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but diversity is, you know, difference. It's recognition of difference between individuals, but also the collective of so, of individuals within groups too. Um, so when we talk about diversity, we're really talking about difference amongst your teams, be that sexual orientation, be it um, an individual's ethnic origin, be it whether the person has a disability or not, their age, their gender and so on and so forth. When we're talking about equity within an organisation, we're talking about you know, fair access, fair treatment, creating opportunities for individuals by recognising actually barriers that might exist within our organisations and really reflecting upon that and creating actions out of that as well. Um, and when we're talking about inclusion, I think inclusion is probably the one that, that people need to focus on a little bit more as well, because we all actually want to feel included. Like you, you see in multiple articles, like for most people, we spend at least a third of our lives in work. So when we talk about inclusion, it's 
turning up to a place of work where we genuinely feel like we're part of a team, we feel that we're heard, we trust um, our managers, we trust our colleagues, and essentially it's a safe place. Like we hear a lot of talk now about psychological safety. And when you talk about psychological safety, what that really boils down to is trust. Actually, having the trust and feeling that there's a safe space for you to come to work um, and to really be yourself. And when we're creating kind of inclusive environments, we're talking about you know, things like having, you know, maybe it's a a, a nursing room in your organisation, you know, for, for parents, maybe it's having gender neutral toilets or facilities. Um, it might be celebrating and recognising different holidays and cultural holidays um, and religious holidays and traditions that people have. So kind of really understanding that there is diversity in our organisation and making sure that everybody feels they have opportunities in the workplace and that actually they're included on a day to day basis. And the reason that that's important, well, there's loads of reasons why it's important. I mean, we know that there is legislative obligations. There's going to be HR people on this call who um, have to do a lot of work in, in the area around legislation and what their legal obligations are. Um, you know, if you look at the Equality Acts, you can see that you absolutely have to tra treat people fairly and give them equal opportunity. But you also have to provide things which we'll talk about later, like reasonable accommodations. Um, but there's also really good business reasons actually for doing it. So um, a couple of the stats that I think are useful for people, if you were to look at some of the Deloitte reporting on this area, you'd see that in their 2020 DNI report, companies who were truly inclusive and had that really truly inclusive culture within their organisations, they were actually eight times more likely to achieve better outcomes, three times more likely to be high performing, and they were actually twice as likely to meet or to exceed financial targets. You also have the other kind of organisations like Great Place to Work who have come out and said that actually organisations where, you know, people do feel valued, they feel included, that actually they're five times more likely to stay in that company. So staff turnover is a big driver here when we're talking about DEI as well. Um, and you'll see a lot of companies too moving into the area of talking about like, you know, CSR a bit more, corporate social responsibility. Um, and ESR too, so the environmental social responsibility even more so. And, and there could be a huge push on, on the E of that because actually it's a little bit more measurable um, in terms of like metrics and creating metrics. But actually the social aspect is hugely important in terms of, you know, your staff turnover, um, your reputation actually as an organisation. So, you know, even um, kind of those score indicators that people do, like what's it like to work for you? Like that's a driver in terms of how attractive you are as well to new talent. And a big thing I'm finding talking to companies is that really we've now shifted from this being um, the employer's market to it very much being an employee's market where actually people care about what you care about. Like they want to know what your values are. They want to know that they're not just signing up for a nine to five tick the box job, but actually they want to to go to work somewhere where they're represented and they're they're valued essentially. Um, and then the last thing I'd say on that is probably customer, even the customer satisfaction side of things. So like for any company out there that 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 does customer or sales or something, you're going to do the job better if you're representing you know, broader society within the core fabric of your organisation as well. Um, and even getting that kind of diversity of thought uh, at the table and when you're making decisions um, that you just don't have a, a whole group of individuals who think the same and look the same um, and have the same kind of mindset. Um, I think the key thing that you touched on there was that in terms of diversity, diversity I think means uh, a lot of different things, a lot of different people. You know, if you're in the only female in a room, if you the like gender equality side of things, if you're, you know, in terms of your race side or ethnicity or even just gender, excuse me, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I think sometimes when companies are looking at putting in their AEI, it's a little bit confusing to even just where to start. You know, should you be celebrating it all the days? Should you be, you know, like you said, it's, am I all of a sudden going to start um, having to spend lots of money on new bathrooms for people, things like that? Or, mm -hmm. or what do I do if I have a um, all male management team? Um, so I think sometimes with companies, I need difficulty really to understand where, where to start. You know, so I suppose if you were a company today, kind of really of any size, I think, is 
what would you say is the first step for companies in regards to looking at their DEI strategy? Um, I think it probably takes careful planning and kind of consideration. Um, that's probably the first thing and buy-in. Like you're, you, in order for any DEI strategy to work, you need to have buy-in from your senior management teams um, and then really from the whole organisation because for it to really work, it needs to trickle down through into the whole organisation. Like we know there, there have been loads of studies done on this kind of Gartner, I did a, a number of surveys around it and they actually found that I think it was 65% of DEI leaders really cited um, managers and their unwillingness actually to really own roles and responsibilities at the top level being the greatest barrier to, to actually implement DEI strategies. So getting that buy-in is a is a is a really, really key kind of factor um, in success. But in order to create any sort of strategy, I think the, the first thing an organization needs to do is take a look at where they're at now. Like so that's doing your kind of that sort of SWOT analysis, you know, like what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses? Um, where are your opportunities and what are the, the 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 threats actually to success for it? So uh, I know that we might talk about it later, but like data collection, even at that stage, like if you really want to know how to to best implement a DEI strategy, you really need to have a look at the data of where you're at now. So like what is the what is the makeup of your organization? Assessing the demographics um, of it. Um, and trying to align kind of your missions and values. And like, that's it. That's a big part of this question, like align it with your missions and values. Well, like, do you know what your mission and values are like before you start off? Um, and are you clear on those? And are your management clear on those? Um, and then once you've kind of identified those things, um, you can look at where's the gaps, like where, like you mentioned there, like if you've got like an all male white kind of leadership team, well then, you know, you may, you may decide that, well, actually looking at our, our missions and values, the, the organisation that we have, the current makeup, one of the key metrics that we want to build into this DEI strategy is to increase gender balance in leadership roles in the organisation. And then that's a really, really useful way of creating the metrics, because actually for any organisation, you also need to make sure you've got clear, measurable um, metrics that you understand what outcomes you're actually working towards. Um, I'd say to any organisation unsure of kind of where to start with this, there, there is a model, it's called the EDI maturity model. It's like a public sector model that was created before. Um, but it's a it's a good way, I think, for an organisation to kind of assess maybe where they're at, have a look at that. It kind of gives different pillars to what you can do. And a big thing around creating a DEI strategy, too, is education. So if we're trying to get buy in from your senior management, like what education do you need to make that happen? Because usually when we're when we're talking about resistance and resistance to change, a big factor in that can be lack of information and lack of awareness and lack of understanding. So like, have you had cultural awareness training? Have you had disability awareness training? Um, you know, have have you gone through um, training around kind of gender roles and unconscious bias and all of that as well within the organization. So I think that that's a that's a big factor, too. Um, but again, linking in with organizations as well, like lots of organizations have created successful DEI strategies. And there are lots of organizations like, you know, employer or the Open Doors Initiative who work in this area, too, that, that you can reach out to um, and get in contact with, because if you're trying to do this as one individual, it is not going to be successful. Um, and even as one individual in the organization, like I've seen companies kind of fall to that before where it's all put on the shoulders of one person or it's put on the shoulders of like their ERG or their internal network where we're talking about big organizations. Um, and you mentioned there as well about kind of people kind of having that fear of like not knowing where to start. Like I think for the HR people on this, be fair to yourself as well. Um, and look at it in a realistic way based on even the size of your organization. So like if you're a company with 30 people, the approach you're going to take is going to be very different to a company with 3000 people, even in terms of collecting information. If, you, if you're doing something that's anonymized or that, um, you're just going to have to be that bit more careful around, around how you're doing this. Um, but the big thing here, I, I suppose the top line stuff is, engagement and education with senior management 
engagement with employees so that you actually understand not just your company's values and mission statement, but actually what, what are the values of your employees and that that's fed into your DEI strategy um, and having a look at where you're at now and setting kind of measurable outcomes and targets that you can actually work towards and to 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 really remove that sort of gap um, within the organisation. I think also one of the key things um, while you're talking about in terms of training, a lot of the training over the last number of years, I would say, is um, you know, a lot of us just have kind of swarm training. It's real quick. It's like, yeah, yeah, we've done tick the box of a five minute training exercise. That now means we're all culturally aware and the rest of trench. So that's great. <laughs> um, so, you know, you did training with that, gosh, almost two months now. And I actually just found that it added so much more in regards to just um, even explain the wording that people can use. Are you a person with disabilities? Am I a person who has a disability? Things like that. Rather, and you can't get that from just one of those one of the middle courses you bought for five years on online, right? Um, yeah. So I think that's really important. Sorry, go on. No, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Like, look, it, diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is an evolving space, and every element related to it is an evolving space. Like. Nobody knows everything. No, there is no human in this world that knows absolutely everything out there. Um, but I think being open to learning is probably the biggest step. Understanding that you don't always have the right terminology and kind of taking the feedback or, you know, if you go into a training session, instead of kind of coming into it with your back up and saying, well, that's not how we do things here as an organisation, understanding that maybe the way you did things before isn't going to work now. Um, and and that's, a, that's a big part of it for organisations to grow, actually, um, both metaphorically and literally. But I, I, I think you're right. Like, this isn't something that we should just be looking at from the recruitment perspective or looking at it from, well, you know, what should we be doing for employees? We should be talking about diversity and equity and inclusion from every element for organisation. And, and we were chatting about this earlier, like I'd even start by looking at like your website. Right. So what what does your website look like? Are you putting on, on your website, you know, stock imagery of people that don't actually exist in your organisation? We in the Open Doors Initiative and Employers for Change um, carried out research on kind of what's best practice around recruitment from an inclusion perspective, taking into consideration all nine protected grounds under the legislation. And like one of the first things that came up was how kind of off-putting it was for people from marginalised or underrepresented backgrounds to see stock images on site. Um, and then maybe to apply and to go in and realise that actually there's there's no diversity or there's no diverse representation in the interview panel. So looking at that, even the website, like the accessibility of it, that outward communication. Um, and then like when we're talking about the, the kind of the recruitment aspect, you need to look at every element like it should be the job specification. How are you writing those? Are you using, you know, gender neutral language? Is it competency based? We shouldn't be writing a job specification that essentially describes our idea of the right individual for it. We should actually be describing the job. And that sounds just so straightforward when you say it. But if you were to go through different organisations and look at their jobs, descriptions, you'd see that that actually they're not doing that. So really writing those job specs based on what's need for the role um, and understanding that like same in, in today's world, like that you're looking for a dynamic individual is not a descriptor of, of what's really required to be successful in the job. You know, it's really open to interpretation. Um, and kind of even if we're talking about communications, being very explicit about what type of communications we're talking about. Similarly, like I, I think inviting people for their feedback at the application stage. So like this, you know, there's a lot to be said for a person doing an application form and having an opportunity to provide your organisation with feedback on their experience. Um, because if you're only doing that at the interview stage, you've just missed a whole cohort of people who who kind of got screened out of that process. Um, again, the shortlisting, the interview itself, like as I said there, really thinking about different types of applications, thinking about the non-EU qualifications as well, will be a really kind of proactive measure I think that organisations could take. 
Um, and when we're talking about the interviews themselves, making sure your interview panel has the appropriate training. I think it's totally unfair actually to to leaders and organisations to put them into, you know, interviews and things where they haven't actually had any uh, diversity, equity, inclusion training of any description. Um, because then what will happen is a person feels totally ill-equipped. Somebody may raise something in the interview and they literally will not know what to do. And so they try to ignore it, which is awful for the individual if they if they share something kind of personal in the, in the interview. Um, but again, inviting feedback on that. Um, and in all of those stages, like asking people, do they have an accommodation need? Again, that accommodation piece for people with disabilities, like a lot of organisations would put those just into the interview, but really they should be putting them onto their website, onto the careers page. They should be stating their commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion on their website. They should absolutely be sharing with candidates their DEI um, policies um, so that they get a really clear understanding of kind of the lay of the land with the organisation. Um, and they should be absolutely reiterating their commitment to providing reasonable accommodations at absolutely every aspect. And then to your point, Crystal, around like it not just being one element, like a lot of the time organisations can do great work. They'll put a huge um, kind of reflection and resources into creating an inclusive recruitment practice. But it's all falling away when the person starts their job. And there's this idea that actually, well, this is a performance issue, but what's actually happened is they've fallen down in terms of the onboarding and the in work experience. So like when we're onboarding people, we need to be looking at how are we doing that? Are we asking them again, even even if they never brought it up before? Do they have a, an accommodation need? Um, thinking about doing like a buddy system, you know, talking to people about the office culture, actually, or or um, kind of maybe the the non work related things happen in an office like, you know, we go to the canteen at 11 usually for a coffee and you're free to use whatever mugs you want or, you know, this is the layout of the office Um, all of that stuff that sometimes we kind of take a little bit for granted. Um, and I think that's even more important if you're working with teams remotely too uh, and ensuring that you're kind of having those conversations. Um, and then in work, having some sort of process actually where, you know, people actually know that they can go to their manager if they need additional support, if there is a, a, an existing barrier. Um, maybe it's something like the reasonable accommodation passport and broadening that out to like the whole organisation, which which some companies have done and has been really, really effective. Um, but I think really stepping back and taking a look at kind of not just the entry part of your organisation, but internally how you are and what your outward communication is about what you're doing. Because again, you could be doing lots of great work internally, but if you are not communicating that out there into the ether, then you're not going to attract diverse um, talent. And I'd also say even in terms of company networks and ERGs, like there is a lot of organisations who, you know, support and utilise their networks really well, but there's others who kind of, they're left a little bit over to one side, kind of in a silo. They kind of do their awareness days. They don't really feed into the, the mainstream policies and procedures of the organisation. And actually, that's not an, an effective use of your talent. Like if you have people in your organisation with lived experience and if 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 they would like, they should be able to have a channel to give feedback as well around kind of what you're doing right and, and take that feedback and action it. Um, it's a big thing, too. And I think we spoke about this before. <clears throat> Two things that really stuck with me is, you know, on every single job advert, you're going to see, you know, good communicators. You know, that's the it's for every single job you're ever going to go to. So what does that communication actually mean, right? Is it that you're going to be up standing in front of people, or is it that you're going to be emailing people, or you're going to be on the phone? So even that small thing can put people off in regards if you're neurodiverse or something like that. If you're really careful about the words that you use, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, so <clears throat> an example I would I, I often use of that is um, there's a, a a woman that I have sat in different panels with, and she has autism, um, and she would say, you know, for her part of being autistic, one of the the barriers that she faces would be telephone calls. Um, the person is an incredible presenter, like 
far better than I am on any calls that I've been with her. Um, really good at communicating, so effective. People always leave those uh, presentations, those conversations saying how brilliant um, they have been and what they've gotten out of it. But if she were to see on a CV or on a job specification that strong communications without it being specified what type of communications, that would ultimately be a barrier because actually the same person will make bookings for services in her in, in her personal life that are a 30 minute drive away um, instead of one that's five minutes because the one that's 30 minutes away, they can book it online. Um, they won't take up the phone. And like we have to understand that, like we're not as individuals all the same, but you also could be missing out on somebody who's a brilliant fit for a role simply because you left a very grey area on that job specification. Um, similarly, I've had people in the past too who, you know, haven't applied for jobs because it has said, you know, that they must they, they must have a full driver's license. Um, and that wasn't a possibility for them. But actually what was really needed was access to transport. So understanding that actually the way you write your job spec is impacting people. Similarly, in that research that we did, like one of the participants, they said, I, I see that today um, job specifications aren't written for me because I don't believe that when people meet me that they automatically assume that I'm energetic and going to work in a fast paced environment. Um, because the person had a physical disability and they felt that that was kind of the the assumptions that were made and therefore they would be cautious about applying for those types of roles. So I think we just really, really need to move away from that sort of template of let's just pop these three things into every job specification in our organisation because it sounds nice um, and it kind of fills up a little bit of space. Um, and just, just it, it, I know it can take a little bit more time, but if you're going to get more suitable candidates for the role and you're going to get diverse talent with diverse viewpoints, then it's surely worthwhile. Yeah, and I, I'd say to people, I'd say to people too, anybody on this, like go to the, the Employers for Change or the Open Doors website, and we'll probably share it there. Like there's a really good toolkit around inclusive recruitment practices. It's totally based on research. Um, you can utilise that yourself. It's a free resource. Um, and there's training as well. Open Doors do the, the inclusive recruitment training with organisations so you can contact them as well um, through the website. But it's 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 information that you will be able to utilise certainly within your organisation. I think the best that I got from that as well was getting the, the, the questions to the candidate for the interview. And a lot of people I spoke to were like, that's cheating, you're not getting the best ones beforehand. But, you know, if you're a good recruiter, you should be able to, you know, understand that that question is just giving the individual, I suppose, the, the outline of what you're going to be asking. So it's up to you as a good recruiter to be able to probe through those questions to actually get the the, the answer that you want. But if it's, if it's allowing, an individual to come and show their best self to you during that interview. That's ultimately what you're looking. Yeah, you're totally right. But also, like, give give them, give everyone the questions. Exactly. You know, yeah. for, if we're worried, if we're if we're going to worry that we're giving somebody a, an unfair advantage, well, you know what? Just share the questions with everyone. We do that. Excuse me. In the Open Doors initiative, we've done it. It's worked really, really well. I sat in on the interviews. It's um. A great way to give people an opportunity to appropriately prepare. Like at the end of the day, is it do we really want interviews that are kind of reflective of like the state examinations? Because that's what you're asking. It's not meant to be a memory test really for people. Like giving people the opportunity to prepare examples. Um, it's I think it's really good actually. And and I'd be inclined to encourage organizations to really start doing that. Maybe pilot it if you're unsure. Pilot with the pilot it with a couple of your roles where you actually give people um, the interview questions just the day before. It doesn't have to be two weeks before. Give them the day before um, and, and see how that works for you. Because I think people would actually be really surprised. Sometimes, you know, we look, we've all gone to interviews. I mean, I have yet to meet somebody who's who's going to tell me that they love doing an interview, right? Because I mean, who yeah, loves that? It's sure, exactly. you know, like no, it's human nature. Nobody likes exactly. to be kind of judged, um, and and it's harder sometimes too, like if it's virtual. Um, so it's I, a, it's I, in a natural setting. If you're you're you sit there for an hour and a half being asked about yourself, say all the good things about you. That's not a normal thing for anybody. Yeah, it's really it can be. Yeah, it's it's look, it's really stressful. And then if you add in on top of that, that like, you know, you're neurodivergent, that actually, 
you know, stre with stress, it can be very, very difficult to really um, kind of, I suppose, formulate answers because you're trying to process information. Um, and then you throw on top of that again, not only do you not have the questions, but actually now the interviewer is asking you two questions rolled into one because they just love asking double barrel questions. So the, 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 a lot of these things are just sort of missteps that we've maybe been making. We just want to rectify them, I would say, as opposed to yeah. kind of saying we're changing things completely. I have a question here, Craig. Just follow up to the question for me is, um, how should you address resistance or pushback from individuals or groups who may be resistant to change or reluctant to, reluctant to embrace diversity and inclusion? Yeah, that's not easy. Like, um, I think from a, a kind of a, a, a change management perspective, again, I go back to the education. Um, I think if if you get good trainers into your organisation, you're bringing everybody in, not just uh, uh, not just kind of a, a, a presenter. You know, we're all going to sit here and listen to what the person has to say, but actually an opportunity in a safe environment where people actually have, have agreed like a code of conduct. Um, where people share their views as to why they they kind of stand on different statements. So we would do that actually as part of the inclusive recruitment training. We'd give statements and we get we get people in the room to move from one side of the room to the other, um, depending on whether they agree or disagree with it. And it's a really good way to break down kind of those barriers that people have about change in the organisation. But I do think that education piece, like we see it time and time again. I know that recently there was a lot around. Uh, I think it was the guy, the Shiakona. Um, they had brought out a policy for transgender colleagues, um, and I think that the, they really, unfortunately, that there was kind of some negative uh, pushback on it. But again, it was stated that there had actually been no education piece around that. Now I don't know the ins and outs of it. That's literally an article I read. But the point here is that you have to do the information, the education piece. You have to be clear on why you're doing um, this, the importance of the changes. Um, and look, if you don't get buy in from people, you just have to be very clear. This is the these are the values of our organisation. This is actually what we stand for. Um, and, you know, if you're going to implement certain things that are policy, well, that that's part of your company policy. And I'm sure there's an expectation that it, that employees, certainly at least while at work, would align with that. You're on mute again. <laughs> Um, we're almost there. <laughs> I would totally agree with you in regards to that. Is that um, <laughs> is is um, I think that sometimes if people won't come along with you on the journey, you just need to make it very clear that um, you know this is this is the journey that we're on. And this is what we stand for, and this is this is what our company is. That is. So, Chris, in regards to best practices, um, in regards to sort of implementing your your DNA strategy, but really kind of focusing on boosting that employee engagement is one, but as well as that productivity. What do you, what would you think mm -hmm. are the best practices that you've seen over the last couple of years? Um, so I think like, for example, I, I, I think Bank of Ireland have actually done, I don't want to be promoting companies one over the other, but they actually have done, I think probably have been quite progressive um, because they were kind of out, out of the traps at a very early stage with the reasonable accommodation passport, that sort of document internally for employees to request an accommodation to remove or to overcome any barriers that might um, exist for them to do their role to the best of their ability. Um, but what they did, and nobody had really done it at the time, was they expanded it out during COVID-19 and, and kept it in place as far as I'm aware. They expanded it out to all employees. So they provided an opportunity, like maybe somebody is a primary carer at home, um, you know, maybe it was during COVID and actually your your kids weren't being schooled in the traditional way and they actually had to be nearly homeschooled. Um, and so that meant that you needed to, between yourself and whoever is in the house, needed to kind of change your working hours. Um, so they were very progressive and they utilised their network. So they utilised their employee resource group um, for that. And they also engaged them in looking at their recruitment process and where were barriers within that recruitment process. Then more recently, they they um, implemented uh, an opportunity for anybody in the organisation to avail of assistive technology. So they made a, a range of assistive technologies 
automatically available. Um, and so it meant that people didn't have to request them in the in the more traditional way. So I suppose the, the key point about that was they listened, like they asked, they listened and they actioned. And I, I think they're probably the, the, the top liners for an organisation. Like if you ask, you need to ask your people, you need to listen to your people. And then there needs to be a, a, an action taken out of it, because if you don't action it, they'll never they're not going to trust you. It breaks down the trust because they don't see what the point is. And, and we've all been in those situations in different jobs where you give feedback and nothing happens and you're just so disheartened because you think, what is the point? Um, so I think I think they're a good example. And it's also a good example of not just deciding, well, I've that done now, actually, you know, continuing to build on, on what you've done year on year. Um, and really reflect back on it and say, well, is there something else actually that we could be doing? Um, other like organisations that that have done a lot of, of work and been very proactive are the likes of, um, I've mentioned it, I think it to you before, Mr. Price Bargains actually have been have been really, really good in this space. Um, but I, I, I do think for any organisation like best practice, it just it comes back to like, why are you doing this? Like what? Like why are you doing it? If if you're doing it because you feel like you have to, it's probably not going to be best practice or be very successful. Um, you know, like I think the organisations who do it well do it because they they see the value in people, they see the value in diversity of thought, and they also, of course, recognise as well the the positive business potential of having a, a strong kind of inclusive workplace culture um, and recognising that actually, well, if we want people to come to work, if we want people to be productive and if we don't want people to leave after a short period of time, well, then they're going to have to feel like they're heard and, you know, they're going to have to trust us. Um, and I think I think that's a big part of it, too. Great. That'd be great. I've got a couple of questions here that we, we might just call into is um, um, so how to post a job description if the role demands a particular gender? In my head, when I was reading reading this question, I was thinking, what job would require a particular gender? But if you were to post a job and require a particular gender, I um, you see that that you. you you can't because well right like what I'd say to that person is you need what to be equal yeah but no it's not even yeah. what role is it like the reality is I don't really know how it would demand a particular gender um unless it's like something very specific where it's some type of security and you specifically need you know it's 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 a female only event you mm. female security like literally now I'm really trying to think here I don't know um but you'd have to be you need to be very careful right it's really the bottom line with this question because under the Equality Acts you can't discriminate uh, in in terms of gender and, and to me that sounds like discrimination there would want to be a very clear um explanation as to why the role requires a specific role or requires a specific gender and, and I to be honest that's the only answer I can really give to that yeah question. no I did oh, yeah even when I was reading it I was trying to think I was kind of think you thought of the security guard is like I'm not sure what role requires yeah it look you need to be before so you the agent you want to talk, yeah, if you want to if you want to talk first of all afterwards feel free to reach out but I'm not I don't yeah know, to be honest. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I think. So we'll go to another question is um how can you measure the effectiveness of DEI and so I actually, and I, I, Nikki might might share it. I, I um, anticipated that um, this might something like this might come up. There's um, a, an article that I, I would say to people to take a look at. It's the Academy of Innovative HR or Innovate HR AI HR. Um, we'll share the link to that. They've got ten in that article. They cover ten DI metrics that an organisation should track actually, in order. Um, to achieve success and they range from things like looking at the makeup of your organization so the demographics looking at the culture so like you know kind of circulating a questionnaire around inclusion so you give in that type of questionnaire you would give statements and you would ask people if they kind of 
range from strongly agree to strongly disagree. So talking about, you know, um, in our organisation, I I see people um, who come from a similar background to me in in leadership roles uh, in our organisation. Um, misogynistic um, commentary and jokes are not acceptable or not are not accepted. Mm-hmm. So those types of things are really, really important, actually, to get a gauge where you're at, because sometimes senior management or leadership teams might have a view of what's happening in the organization. But actually, when you when you go further in, you realize that that's not felt in the in the rest of the organization. Um, you might also want to look at like, you know, things like even like your your kind of your your score. So like if if you're now I know it's not completely accurate, but for some organizations, one of the metrics that they use is looking actually at, well, how do we rate on on kind of any of the websites, you know, like they like Star Glass or things like that. Yeah. Um so there's lots of different ones that you can use, but you really have to recognize what's going to work for your organization. So obviously if one of the the, the big gaps here is going to be gender, well then gender representation within leadership teams will be a good measure, right, of how effective your DI initiative is. Similarly, if kind of um, ethnic diversity is where the gap lies in your organisation. Um, in, in, uh, but if, if you have diversity in the organisation in terms of ethnicity, but you don't have it in senior roles, well then that's going to be a measure. Similarly, if it's that actually you've you at the start you've looked you've said our organization is not diverse and we're not on a we you know obviously if you're not in a hiring freeze you know a measure of how effective the di initiative is going to be kind of well actually in in the last 12 months what has the diversity of new recruits been so it very much is going to depend on what your starting point is where the gaps are um and that's going to be how you should measure kind of the effectiveness of that. You will not be able to measure the effectiveness of your DI initiative unless you know where you're at now. So that's the big thing on that one. And I think as well is that you don't have to beat yourself up in regards to where you are now. Oh. So long as you just understand it, address it, move forward, right? Yeah, don't fear, like don't actually fear where you are now and 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 don't try to avoid it on the basis that you're like, well, I'm just going to maybe leave it 12 months and do these kind of couple of things and then I'll do it because actually things might look a bit better. Give yourself the opportunity to have a true measure of the work you have done um, and collect that information, set your goals and then come back and reflect on, on where, where you're going. I also think like for some organisation, the effectiveness of the initiative is, you know, well, we got 90 90 percent of the organization has undertaken training in, mm-hmm. in three different DEI areas in the first 12 months. Like that can be a measure of effectiveness. Um, just don't get too. I would say to you, yes, you have to be able to measure, you know, success, but the success doesn't have to be like that in the first 12 months of your DEI initiative that you've seen like a 100 percent increase. Um, in, in yeah. the diver- diversity of the team, like, you know, like be realistic, depending on where you're starting from. And that your whole leadership team is now changed and you've got every, everybody. Yeah. You know, you're not, it's not, we hope you, but it's, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so no. Just another question here is uh, we currently do not collect diversity data. Okay, so I'm actually going to just pop here to the next slide because this is one that we're going to cover next. Is um, we currently do not collect diversity data, gender, race, etc. How do I collate that as a lead employee to express consent for GDPR special category data? And some employees may, may not be prepared to provide it even anonymously. So, you know, it's a question we okay. get over and over again in regards to what can you collect and why we collect. Yeah, so look, the data collection, it is absolutely like it's a good way of gauging your starting point, you know, um, laying out kind of what key indicators there are within the organization on, on where you want to go. Um, but for it to work, you need to be really clear on the why. Like, why are you doing it? Where the information is going and what you're going to action out of it. So not necessarily the, the bones of what you're going to action, but like, you know, what are you going to do here? Um, and like that person there is mentioned GDPR compliance, and that is a concern for people. But the thing with GDPR is you just have to be very clear on why why you're actually collecting this data, um, and again where it's going. If you're going to try and encourage employees to participate in any type of data collection 
um, initiative or survey, you're going to have to have a very clear statement of intent, right? Like the, the, the first thing before I even I would even start worrying about the questions that you're going to write. The first thing I'd worry about is how am I presenting this to employees? So like your statement of intent should talk about the type of organisation you are, the values of your organisation, where this data collection fits in with that, um, why you're doing it. So like we're doing this maybe because we are um, we want to be a more inclusive and diverse organisation and by collecting this data, it will give us an opportunity, you know, to to review where we are right now and what proactive steps we can take to improve the workplace culture um, for the whole organisation or whatever it might be. But there, it just there needs to be absolute clarity because people will not answer otherwise. I've seen this in public sector actually where there's data collection done around disability because under the Disability Act um, 2005, organisations have that 3% quota, it's moving to 6%, but the 3% quota in terms of percentage of employees with disabilities. And what happens time and time again is that, you know, public or semi-state bodies will send out a survey, there's a really low return on that or uptake, and a huge part of it is the wording because actually what tends to go in is the Disability Act definition of disability and asking the person do they have it and a sentence basically saying you know we are collecting this data because we have an obligation under the Disability Act 2005 and like nobody wants to answer that because people feel like well A you don't really want you know you're not looking for this information because it's going to be used yeah, from the yeah. proactive um, and B actually you're just doing something that's a legislative obligation you're not doing it for my well-being you're not doing it because you want to improve things in the organization for me or anything like that so it's an opportunity there's an opportunity here with this to build trust with your employees like we have to they have to be informed um, and I would say even like when you're you know before you 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 disseminate or you share the 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 survey amongst the organisation, have some town halls or have some Zooms or whatever you want to call them. Just have some opportunities to share with people, you know, why you're doing this, where the data is going, um, and then actually you're looking to take actions out of it. That's the big thing. Uh, in terms of the content, there's lots of examples online around the types of questions you might ask. Again, though, I would say it, it shouldn't just be a diversity survey it should also be an inclusion survey. So that's going to really measure the attitudes and, and, and what you do with that data afterwards, how you analyze it. So if you're a, a, a larger organization, you might want to send out a combined survey, right? Because if it's anonymized um, if, and you're a smaller organization, it might be much easier to identify a person from a certain demographic. And it might be, you know, they may not want to then share like what the attitudes they're experiencing is because they'll know you're going to be able to identify them. That's why I'm saying about the size of the organisation. But for larger organisations, when you're sending out those, if you do it as a DNI survey, when the data comes back to you, you're going to actually be able to analyse that data and decipher, well, is there a correlation between a person's gender, actually, and how they've answered these questions? Is there a correlation between the person's ethnicity and and the attitudes that they experience within the organisation? Um, so that's really useful, too. So like. It's no good collecting the information if it isn't correctly analysed um, and it's no good collecting the information and analysing it if you don't actually present the findings of it to your employees um, and show that you're going to take action. Yeah. So in terms of obviously your funded by the Open Doors initiative or through the Open Doors initiative umbrella, what are the funding or what funding is available for companies who really want to start their GE and I journey? Yeah, so in terms of ourselves, so with Employers for Change, we provide uh, free advice and information to employers around disability in particular. So if like any employer out there, maybe you've taken on somebody or there's a colleague, you're not sure what reasonable accommodations they need, um, we're free service, you can get in touch with us and we do kind of one hour training sessions as well for, for teams as well. Um, there's also the reasonable accommodation passport. I've referenced it a few times. That's available on our website, it's free to download. It's a document that we did with IBEC and the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. But for any of the HR people on this, it might be a good starting point in terms of creating um, a, a reasonable accommodation policy um, for, for your organisation. Beyond that, then, from a monetary perspective, 
There's actually a disability awareness training scheme available through the Department of Social Protection. Um, so basically you could, we do the, the shorter um, sessions, but let's say you wanted to do maybe like a half day or day's training session that really delves deep into disability awareness um, for members of your organisation or your leadership team. This is a fund that then you can go and you can retrospectively um, get the, the funds for that training. They will provide the funds up to 20,000 euros. So it's actually a huge fund um, for an organisation to be able to access and people don't utilise it really very much. You also have the reasonable accommodation fund that has four strands to it. So within that, you've got the workplace adaptation grant. That's a grant that goes up to, I think it's circa 6,350 euros. Um, they will go up to just around 9,000 euros if there are exceptional circumstances. But essentially that's for you to like upgrade or to acquire equipment for an employee with a disability should they need it. Um, you've got the personal reader grant with that as well if an individual needs um, a personal reader for work related reading. Um, there's a job interview interpreter grant, the third strand of it. So again, if a person needs an interpreter for interview, they can avail of that grant. They can also avail of it for onboarding as well. Um, and then the fourth strand of that is the employee retention grant. Now, this is totally underutilized. So the employee retention grant is if an employee within your organization acquires a disability. The grant in the first strand, you can um, get 2,500 euros, and that's really to get a professional to come into the organization to identify any accommodations or training um, or changes that are needed to enable that person to remain in their role um, or their current position. And then the second strand of it is 12,500 euros, and that's actually to implement the recommended changes. So again, quite a significant grant. Um, and then the last one is like the the wage subsidy scheme. Again, that's a financial kind of aid for employers for employing a person with a disability. So that looks at providing, I think it's um, just under seven euros per hour up to like 12,000 euros um, directly to the employer for an employee with a disability um, just to subsidise uh, their wage. Um, and then you've got other things like, you know, you've got Jobs Plus as well, which goes beyond disability and, you know, it, it supports the employer to take on people who are more long term unemployed. So there are lots of grants and we're going to share a link to those. Um, the big hmm. problem with the grants is they're underutilised. Again, if, if you're applying for anything and you're getting a little bit overwhelmed with it or you, you're finding it difficult or coming up against any barriers, you just get it. You can get in touch with us. You can contact me um, directly and we'll share my details afterwards. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. It's been so wonderful to have you with us today and I really enjoy talking to you um, always. Um, so hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Uh, you'll be tired of talking talking to me. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. So best place. So we'll share first of all uh, details. Um, anyway, when we send out the, the webinar and um, if there's any questions we haven't got as well, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to them. But thank you everybody for your time. Thank you for so much for your time. And, thank you so uh, much. We'll have a lovely day. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.